Web of Lies, Chapter Two, Whisked Away. At four a.m., the serene early morning atmosphere of Tidmouth Yards was shaken by a little engine's distant panting. Before long, Percy was petering under the signal gantry and into the biggest yard on the island. He had slipped out after midnight to take his night train, and now he had returned, triumphant but exhausted. The pride on his face as he came to a halt on Platform 5 of the big station said it all. He parked his train and ran around it, chuffering slowly away to rest. A few minutes after Percy had gone, a black shape grew out of the shadows behind the mail cars. A shunter's pole rang out quietly, a coupling engaged, and the three vans slithered silently backward into the darkness. Percy was none the wiser. The little green engine made his way to the sheds. As he sleepily limped up to the huge silhouette of home, a familiar blue tank engine crept quietly through the doors, taking great care not to wake anyone. He had to get back to the branch line before work began. He had to laugh, seeing Percy's sleepless face. Man, you've been through the ringer. You've got more bags under your eyes than in your cars. Percy just yawned. Very funny. Thomas relented and asked genuinely, How was the mail? He smiled with what little energy he had left and spoke in a drowsy voice. It was... A yawn punctuated his sentence abruptly. Splendid. We made great time. The coaches are on platform five now. Bear will handle them later. But Thomas was perplexed. He could see the big station clearly from the sheds. There was no sign of the mail cars. Alarm bells went off in Thomas's head. He tried not to show it, but even in Percy's exhausted state, he could read his friend's face so clearly. "'Is something wrong, Thomas?' he mumbled, followed by another yawn. So Thomas compensated with an even wider, more relaxed smile. "'No, no, not at all. Just, uh, you should get some rest.' "'Ha!' yucked the little engine. "'You're telling me!' And he began to chuff toward the big engine sheds. But Thomas only stared at him, confused. He pulled forward over the points and gave Percy a bump, pressing lightly against him to stop him moving. Whoa, whoa, hold on, sleep roller. Where do you think you're going? Percy yawned until his tired ma took up half his face. To my berth. And he pushed on, but Thomas held back. The small engine bounced back and forth as his wheels spun, testing the springs in Thomas's buffers. You live at Farquhar now, remember, buddy? A flicker of realization came over Percy's face, and he said in a daze, Oh, yeah, I forgot. He began to back up toward the yard, but he clanged against the points, which were now set for Henry, who would no doubt be awake any minute. Thomas watched as Percy's wheels kept spinning against the unyielding rail, his eyes now totally closed again. (laughs) On second thought, maybe you want to take a power nap here. I'm sure Toby can manage. Toby had grown to hate that particular sentence over the years, but he wasn't here to complain, so both engines agreed. Thomas clattered dapperly over the crossover and held the points open in a gentlemanly fashion. Percy slugged past him, giving him the quietest, most breathless peep imaginable, and fell asleep on an entry line before he got anywhere near the turntable. He was clear of the doors, though, so Thomas left him in peace. Percy really is strong-willed, he thought to himself with respect. That, coming from Thomas, was the highest praise one could receive. His next thought was much more grave. Now to find those mail cars. Thomas had not suspected foul play at all. More likely, he figured Percy had been so tired that he'd left them in the wrong place. He was in for a shock. Thomas crept up to the great station, whose presence was even more imposing at late hours with no one around. The structure was like a sleeping giant, sprawled out in the middle of Tidmouth Town, taking up as much space as the surrounding terrace houses and offices would allow it. But its snoring was anything but giant. A low-frequency buzz from the electric lights that swung from the supporting gantries every few feet. The ones that hung above Platform 5 laid bare the truth. The mail cars really weren't there. Thomas chewed on the problem for a minute. It wasn't unheard of for Percy to leave the cars at the wrong platform, but to miss the station altogether, something wasn't adding up. It was at that moment that Thomas heard a commotion in the goods yard. 
This was strange, because Henry's vans were all shunted to the quay the evening before and loaded overnight. Nobody should have been moving over there. But somebody was. Thomas, eternally ignorant of what had happened to the cat, rolled toward the dockside to indulge his curiosity. The sun had risen just enough that the whole yard was colored a dark purple, the cranes swung back and forth, contrasted against the brightening horizon, meaning the docks were already hard at work. It would have been peaceful if not for two things, the wretched smell of fish and the impending threat of a trespasser. All things considered, Thomas was still much more threatened by the former. The harbor had many different lines sprawling to various offloading sidings. Some ran underneath cranes, some split off to specific industries or warehouses. All of them were laid into the concrete, giving the damp ground a glossy sheen as purple as the atmosphere was. Occasionally, Thomas could catch his reflection in a puddle where the pavement wasn't totally even. Whether it was rainwater or salt water, he couldn't be sure. The yards were expansive, but the most important part of Tidmouth Harbor was the jetties. These were truly monumental structures, stretching a mile out to sea and all made of concrete, lined with worn-down timbers around the edges. There were two of these, each with several tracks for loading and storing different kinds of cargo. But the one that interested Thomas was the northern one, where Henry's fist train stood in wait for its engine. That is, until it moved. With a subtle biff, it rolled forward a few feet. Someone had shunted the back of it. There was only one engine it could be. Perhaps he had forgotten to add some vans? No, thought Thomas. Diesel never forgets anything. He picked up the pace, whooshing past van after van, roaring through the great big warehouse owned by the Sodor Shipping Company, and skidding to a halt on the other side. Aha! Diesel nearly backed through the buffers and into the ocean with surprise. A visit from the tank engine had not been part of his plan, clearly. Thomas saw what the diesel had shunted onto the back of the train— all three of Percy's precious mail cars, and all the important parcels they contained. Diesel, what are you doing with those? Diesel employed his best poker face. His buffers were still pressed against the rearmost mail car. This did not look good. So he thought up a lie, and he thought it up quick. Last minute change to the schedule. The main line mail to London has been cancelled today, so Henry will take what he can to Manchester. Funny, said Thomas, with no hint of humor in his voice. Percy didn't mention a thing about that. Drat, thought the diesel to himself. He should have taken the squeaker into account. This was quickly becoming a scene. Give me those! Now! His voice was as unyielding as the steel he was made from. I've told you they've been reallocated. Ask Sir Topham Hatt when he comes in. He'll confirm what I've said. The train will be long gone by then. Well then, smirked diesel. I suppose you'll just have to take me at my word. <laughs> As if, Thomas grimaced and implored him again. Hand them over. If I do, I'll be in hot water with Sir Topham Hatt, and so will you, you know. I'll gladly take that risk, the tank engine said boldly. This train is Percy's pride and joy. He doesn't have as many important jobs as I do. This is his only one. I'll be damned if I let you lose it. Diesel felt insulted. I have never lost anything. If something goes missing, it is because I will it to. So you admit it. I said if. I was being hypothetical. I don't know what that means, shouted the tank engine, and he called back to his crew. Marcel, throw the points. We're doing this the hard way. Marcel, who was equal parts lucky and unfortunate to be Thomas the tank engine stoker, shot a look at the driver. He's not suggesting we pull the diesel off, is he, Maxine? Maxine just clapped a hand on her fireman's shoulder and said, You've been at this too long to have any doubts, Marcy. And she split into a wicked grin. Change the points. And she swung Thomas's brakes off again with feeling. Diesel began to panic. You're not honestly going to try this. It's far beyond the boundaries of railway protocol. But Thomas just smirked as he swerved over the sharp points. The driver threw him in reverse. Shunting the shunter, you mean? I think there's a subsection about it somewhere in the rule book. And he flew into Diesel with a bang. They were back to back now. Thomas couldn't see the front of the train, but he imagined it had jerked forward by yards this time and not only feet. Marcel, who was still on the concrete, found a shunter's pole. They looked at the metal tool in their hands and then to the couplings between the two engines. They sighed with regret and reached out to connect them. 
Thomas clasped onto Devious Diesel with a resounding clank. Get your couplings off me, you bright blue nuisance, he snapped. I'm doing important work here. It's never a good sign when you say that, Thomas recalled. And then he heaved forward, dragging Diesel and the train toward the buffers with all his might. Settle down, Maxine, called Marcel from ground level. I haven't uncoupled Diesel yet. It wasn't me, it was Thomas. Was not, put in the engine. To be fair, the difference was often hard to ascertain with Thomas. Marcel hurried to Diesel's front. Diesel spewed gray smoke in their direction, and the smoke screen nearly blinded them. Back off, you pest. I shan't surrender these cars. Marcel ignored the vain engine trying to give them orders and burrowed headlong through the foul air and out the other side. Their vision cleared up just in time to dodge a near-fatal blow from yet another shunter's pole. Marcel dashed backward just in time to save their skull. One look at the offender's oil-stained overalls and Sodor Diesel Works-themed undershirt told them this was the man who'd driven Devious Diesel out onto the Tidmouth jetty. But it wasn't Diesel's typical driver. Marcel countered the next blow with their own shunter's pole. They had both chosen the same weapon, though Marcel hadn't picked it with that use in mind. Another ill-placed swing brought the man flying past Marcel, veering so close that they could smell his breath. Strangely minty for a crook, though it didn't set them at ease. Meanwhile, Maxine slid down Thomas's cab railing like a pair of firehouse poles and planted herself firmly on the concrete, taking off running in the direction of the scuffle. Several more clashes of metal rang out before finally Marcel got in one good swing and their adversary's weapon was hooked loose of their hands and thrown clean into the sea. The crook, suddenly losing all confidence without a lump of steel to wield, skittered away with haste. He swung the door open on one of the mail cars and clambered inside, banging it behind him. Adam Mossy called Thomas. He couldn't see a thing facing the direction he was, but the pole soaring past his smoke box and into the ocean had been a pretty good indication that his firemen had won the fight. But Marcel felt guilty. Tidmouth dock workers were always complaining about how hard it was to find a pole. Now they'd have to grumble just a little bit more. Maxine reached Marcel just as the crook had made his escape. Relief flooded her senses at seeing her friend was all right. And after that, she was overcome by pride. Nice job, Marcy! And she nudged their elbow encouragingly. You really held your own. Where'd you learn to fight like that, eh? Well, not martial arts class, that's for sure, was all the history that they would surrender. Thomas's crew returned to his cab. But to Marcel's surprise, they weren't seeking shelter. The driver shut off steam entirely. Come on, gestured the driver. Let's finish this. And she mounted the engine steps again. But Marcel was more cautious and made it abundantly clear. Well, they could be an escaped felon. Marcel quivered at their next frightening hypothetical. Or some sort of terrorist. Maxine returned to the footplate and put both hands on her fireman's shoulders. They were strong and with some effort, she managed to steady their nervous rocking. That's all the more reason we have to stop the bastard. Who knows what he's up to? But all the same, she took note of Marcel's shivering. I'll go alone, if you want to stay here and watch the engines. But Marcel cut that idea down at once. No way. I'd rather call the cops, but uh, if you insist on taking this person on yourself, then I've got your back. Maxine gave them a firm, grateful nod. Her smile brought the crow's feet out around her eyes. Marcel wondered if Maxine was getting too old for this kind of excitement. But if she was, she certainly wasn't willing to admit it. So they both leapt down from the cab to catch the crook themselves. Thomas the tank engine, it seemed, always attracted the most interesting people to his footplate. Maxine was one of those people. She was a sturdily built woman who took little care to keep her work clothes clean. Her hair was buzzed short and grew wild and spiny at the top. Stripes of vibrant blue streaked across her head in random places, and there were also trace signs of a yellow dye which hadn't worked out so well and had yet to be washed out. She was pushing 50 now, but her youthful spirit was alive and well. She'd been an activist for civil rights in the 60s, and steam preservation, of course, if you couldn't guess that, and she hadn't lost that rebellious spirit. She wore an old leather racing hood with goggles built in, it was down around her neck right now, as it was most days on the branch line. But when Thomas and his crew got the chance to coast along the main line, Maxine would pull the hood over her head and look into the wind as they flew down Gordon's Hill at 70 miles an hour. 
She had used to race rally cars, you see, but the thrill became too lackluster, so she went to drive Thomas the tank engine instead. Now, her life was never boring. On the other hand, or perhaps other side of the cab, Thomas's stoker Marcel was quite mild-mannered. They were not a thrill-seeker in the slightest. They had been an accountant before taking this job. It had been a rather miserable experience. They were brilliant with numbers and had their thumb on the company's pulse, but office life was becoming soul-crushing. The final nail in the coffin was when management changed, and upon discovering that Marcel did not fancy himself male or female, the new CEO sniffed in disapproval and insisted on picking a gender for them anyway. The day that Marcel quit was the same day that the fat controller had come in to renegotiate some accounts. Those negotiations never took place. They had run into each other just outside the office. The fat controller took an immediate liking to the accountant, who had apologized profusely and needlessly for bumping into him. Noticing the tired, unsure look on their face, Sir Charles could not help but inquire. Regrettably for Marcel, the truth came spilling out in a warbly, unsteady tone with more than a few tears. Sir Charles had listened intently to it all. He was late for his meeting at that point, but it didn't make a lick of difference. He had just made two decisions on the spot. Firstly, he had ended all dealings with the firm, intent on finding a better company to do business with. Secondly, he had offered Marcel a job. Uh, I'm an accountant, sir. I, I know very little about locomotives. You said you were interested in a change. Well, here it is. Marcel shuffled their feet back and forth, mulling over the enormous opportunity. It did sound thrilling. They just weren't sure they were equal to it. I don't know that I have the strength of character to work for your railway, sir. Aren't the engines rather lively? Oh, very. But you've been through quite an ordeal here from the sound of it. I promise you, my railway will be easier than spending ten years in this place. Marcel thought about it. They had a feeling that might actually be true. Besides, and Charles came closer, saying the next bit with more gravity... I need someone with a level head for this job. I've already hired a driver, and she's exceptional. But she, uh, encourages the engine more than I would like. I need someone to balance them out. Someone with a steady head. Marcel pointed to themselves with a shaky hand, their mouth formed into a perfect O. They almost couldn't believe it was them the fat controller was talking about. They only nodded. Well then, there was only one more question to be asked. Uh, which engine would it be, sir? Ah, yes. He seemed to hesitate, worried that this might blow the whole ordeal. Please don't turn and run. Oh, no. Who could it be? Some nefarious diesel in Vickerstown? One of the highly strung tender engines at Tidmouth? Their blood froze in their veins when another thought occurred to them. Surely Sir Charles wouldn't make them the driver of Diesel 10. But the answer utterly shocked them. Thomas the tank engine. He needs someone new to tend his fire. That, I hope, will be you, my friend. Uh, sir? Uh, uh, of course, sir. Why would I ever say no to that? Climbing into a mail car from pavement level, swinging one leg onto the floor while Maxine dragged them up into a van which might just contain a wanted criminal, Marcel was starting to understand the perils of driving the number one blue engine that might have turned others away. But even with their heart drumming in their chest and their mind racing with horrifying outcomes to this whole endeavor, there was still no other engine in the world that they would rather crew and no other driver they'd follow into service. Or to battle, as it now seemed. The car was dark. Both driver and stoker made slow, silent movements along the corridor. The walls were packed with small cubbies for sorting letters and parcels. Every now and then, a big bag of mail threatened to trip the duo, letters that were meant to be sorted on the journey. How confused the sorters back at Tidmouth Station must be right now that their train had up and disappeared. Maxine kicked a bag aside. Maxine, careful, insisted Marcel. This is people's mail we're dealing with. There are checks in there, court summons. Maxine nodded and tried to be more delicate. This was not the environment to be careless. 
Just then, the crazed diesel driver hopped out from a large cabinet and descended on Maxine. He slammed her over the head with a big, flat parcel. When her head tore through the middle of it and out the other side, it was obvious it was some sort of painting. It hung around her neck like a poncho. She stumbled to the floor. You creep, she screamed, and hurled any small box she could find on the floor at him. Most of them were stamped with the word fragile in red ink. With a defeated shrug, Marcel picked up the heftiest mailbag they could find by the drawstrings and hurled it around in circles like they were shot putting at the Olympic Games. It caught the mad engine man in the chest and he went down with a thud, landing flat in a pile of postcards. Maxine wasted no time leaping on top of him and pinning him to the ground. What the hell are you doing with these cars? She shouted at him. Answer me, man! He stuttered timidly, his wild eyes flickering. The, 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 the revolution? We have to continue the revolution. A speaking gibberish, Maxine called back to her stoker without taking her eyes off the man. What revolution? The, the, the triumph of diesel over steam. The modernization of British rail. And he jerked upward, but Maxine forced him back down. What do you care? You're a loco man, not a bureaucrat. And she shook her head. It sounded like something an engine might say. It smacked of childlike simplicity. And you're a bit late, pal. That fight's already been fought and won. No, 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 the man stammered, clearly disturbed. He says there's, a, there's more work to do. We must complete the transformation, he told me. Who is he, wondered Marcel, keeping their fists up in apprehension. The engine man gulped and wheezed a shaky response out of his dry throat. The diesel. That was the last thing either driver or fireman had expected to hear. They both looked at each other in bemusement. They couldn't believe their ears. You're blaming your engine, Maxine mused. That moment's distraction was enough to give the diesel man the edge. He flung Maxine off of him and she tumbled down to the floor, only coming to a stop when she swung her fist out like a brake and skidded to a stop on the cold wood floor. Maxine, are you all right? called Marcel, petrified. But Maxine didn't respond right away. No breath left in her lungs. Marcel was filled with a rare fury. The crazed diesel man surged toward them, but a swift left hook brought him down. Marcel followed suit, forcing his arms to the floor. But then he overpowered them, and they twisted and twirled across the floor in a sea of post. They only came to a stop when they slammed up against the wall. They were going to hurt all over next morning. That much was certain. The lunatic had ended up on top, and it took all of Marcel's strength to keep him at bay. Maxine was coming to her feet across the car and limping toward them with a vengeance. But Marcel wouldn't need the assist. Using both feet, they hurled the driver across the car, slamming him into another set of cubbies. The wooden boxes collapsed to the ground on top of him, burying him in letters. He was subdued at last. Maxine held out her hand and pulled her fireman upright. A few bones creaked for both of them, as both driver and stoker found their feet. Both Marcel and Maxine, with their jackets ripped and their trousers frayed, smeared with ink and covered in paper cuts, stood drowsily at the end of the car. The room was a travesty. If Percy could see it now, he would have burst into tears. They would set it all right in time. But first, they had to get home. And even before that, they had to deal with this agent of espionage. Grab an arm, said Maxine, a little too calmly. What are we going to do with him? Marcel piped up. Maxine just grinned. I think this rascal needs to be sorted. What do you think, Marcy? Not you're nice. Marcel scooped the unconscious scoundrel up by the other shoulder, and together they both heaved him into the mail car's sorting room and locked him inside. Let's go tell the station master, so he can... But the train jerked, and both driver and fireman stumbled. Marcel nearly hit the floor, but Maxine hooked their arm and kept them upright. They were moving now. The howling sound of Henry's whistle sealed their fate. We have to get back to our engine. We're still coupled on, Marcel cried, frantically but logically, and reached for the door. But Maxine just threw her arm in front of them, and they ran into it with a wind-stealing thump. The driver shook her head gravely, and Marcel understood. Maxine may have been daring when it suited her, but she knew the difference between a risk and a death wish. It's too late. The train will only pick up speed from here. But we've got to warn Henry's crew. 
Is there a phone in here? A radio? And they searched around hastily. Do I need to remind you what year these cars were built? Maxine pointed out. And by which railway? One that hadn't existed for 70 years, was the unfortunate answer. Well, there's got to be some way to contact them, insisted Marcel. Send a letter, Maxine joked. But it wasn't unthinkable. A well-aimed paper airplane might actually work if they had been shooting for the brake fan and not the engine. Crazier forms of communication had been tried. The lunchbox method was tried and true among engine men. But, of course, they were at the tail end of the train. A train with no brake fan. On top of that being dangerous in and of itself, it also meant that there were only two people on this whole train who could stop it, and there was no way to contact either of them. They would just have to wait it out. So Maxine pulled up a sorting bench and took a seat. Marcel, reluctantly and with much anxiety, dropped to the floor, folded their knees to their chest, and counted the minutes. Meanwhile, the two engines hooked to the back of the train were frantic. Henry! called Thomas at the top of his tubes. Stop! We're still coupled on! How can he not tell? Diesel was in awe. He looked like he was running calculations in his head. Because he's one of our strongest, Diesel. He's handled trains twice this size without breaking a sweat. He's a mongrel. A half-baked butcher's job. Thomas fumed at these insults. It's not like he hadn't heard them before. He had underestimated Henry once upon a time himself. They all had. But he knew better now, and saw to it that Diesel was educated. Is that what you think? Well, this mongrel is about to pull us halfway across England without even feeling it. So rattle your rods and bang your bonnet and maybe he'll hear us back here. Thomas tried to whistle, but he couldn't without Maxine there to pull the cord. His panicked shouts did nothing. Henry thundered on. The wind hurtled past both of them. Thomas could only see a faint sliver of Henry's large tender at the head of the train. At last, both engines accepted that there was no chance of getting his attention. They tried to get comfortable, but their tiny wheels spinning at a speed neither engine was ever designed for was most unpleasant. This was going to be a very long ride.